on this episode of You're Included. Dr. C. Baxter Kruger, theologian and author, with Paul Young, author of The Shack. They talk with us about Dr. Kruger's book, The Shack Revisited, and the theology embedded in Young's original narrative. Our host today is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Well, Baxter and Paul, thanks for being with us again. Great it's to good be to here. see you guys. Good to be back. We want to talk about a new book this time, The Shack Revisited. So this is an endeavor that uh, you guys have been working on in tandem. Uh, Paul's got the foreword here and Baxter's been doing theology that supports The Shack. Can you tell us how you got into this, what happened, how it, how it came to be, and where you are with it? The, the short version is that Paul and I have become great friends over the last several years and done several conferences and things like that together. And then I started getting invited to do things like Theology Shacket conferences. And we bumped into each other in Toronto at a conference and ha ended up having an afternoon to spend together. So I showed him some scribble notes that I had. And he said, well, maybe we, you could write that into a book and uh, we'll see. So I went basically off the grid for eight months and I wanted to show how the, the core vision of the shack, which is done in drama, and, um, and in a right, very right brain way, I wanted to show how that core vision is in fact the early church and is in fact the main line coming all the way through. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. One is when I read the shack, I, I'm thinking I'm reading Athanasius. I'm reading J.B. Torrance. I'm reading uh, George MacDonald. I mean, this is so beautiful and it's in a form that people can understand, but I just felt that there were, uh, there were many people who said, okay, somebody grabbed me by the hand and help me go to the next step. Help me see this. Is this biblical? Is this where historically accurate? What you know? What is going on here? So I'm trying to unpack all the nuances that are bedded into or embedded into the, the narrative of the shack. And so, for some people who are, um, their heart just leaped and and they were touched deeply by the shack, Baxter comes along and says, "I want to encourage and affirm that this is not new theology. This is something that is actually traditional." And then for those whose paradigms were tampered by the shack, were a little upset, this is to come along and say, you really need to think about these questions because this is why you're bothered. And those are some of the implications of doing a, doing a book like this. I'm, I'm very excited. And Baxter writes in a very accessible way. It's not a highbrow theological treatise, but it's very supported for those who uh, like that sort of thing. And yet it's, it's very much a story itself and, uh, and again, very accessible. Let's talk about uh, some of the things that you have said in here and, and uh, let's get into it a little bit. But let me just read this. Uh, you wrote this and then a section from the shack mm -hmm. and then if I could get, uh, get both of you to comment. Uh, this is one of the many reasons that the Trinity is so critical, for if God were alone and solitary from eternity, then there is nothing for God to love until he creates. So the solitary God can only become a lover, for he is not one by nature. And this love could only be a love that grows out of his aloneness and self-interest. And it's more than possible that whatever it was that caused the single person to God to create and become a lover could change and the solitary God could then go back to his essential non-loving nature. The love of this God is caused by something outside of his being, and is this not what we all fear, that something outside of the being of God causes him to love us, that his love is conditioned by something other than his nature, and thus that we're the ones who must get it right, trip the love wire, make God's love happen, and keep it happening. No wonder we're so exhausted and unhappy. And then the quotation from the shack. This is uh, Jesus, or Mac McKenzie talking to Jesus. Why do you love us humans? I suppose I, as he spoke, he realized he hadn't formed his question very well. I guess what I want to ask is why do you love me when I have nothing to offer you? If you think about it, Mac, Jesus answered, it should be very freeing to know that you can offer us nothing, at least not anything that can add or take away from who we are. That should alleviate any pressure to perform. From page 202. 
Let's talk about that. The, it's very common to think of God. I mean, I, I still do it, at, 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 of God as solitary figure sitting up in the heaven somewhere on a throne. He's got probably, you know, a, a white beard, and he's very wise and very uh, kind and uh, loving most of the time, I think. I hope he is, and I hope he, yeah, I hope he listens when I'm begging him to, you know, uh, help me get a home run or something like that. I call it Gandalf with an attitude. Is, yeah, yeah, there we are. Yeah. Um, and frankly, that's why I went such a different direction in the story. That's why Papa is about as far away from Gandalf with an attitude as you can Santa get. Or Santa Claus. Or Santa Claus who's got exactly. a list and checking it yeah. twice and look out because right. he's coming to town, right? right? A very, very unfortunate song that does great disservice to uh, Santa Claus. It, it does. Very and bad publicity. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, part of this, as you were reading it, struck me again, that if perfect love casts out fear, and if God is perfect love, what kind of image of God do we have? Why, do, why are we afraid? where we have fear and love commingled in the relationship. I mean, if, if perfect love casts out fear and I look to the God that, that I fear in that, in that negative phobia kind of sense where I'm, you know, I'm, af I'm afraid in, in, the, in the worst kind of way, judgment and, and even worse than that, disappointment. You know, I'm afraid that I'm a disappointment. The, the things that I would fear most in my relationship with my own father, for example, and, uh, but if that's supposed to be the source of my freedom and the source of where I have to go to get away from that fear, and yet it is the source of that fear, I I'm stuck. I, I have a major problem here, and I don't know where to go. Where do I turn to in terms of trying to deal with that? Fear God and keep his commandments. That's what we hear preached. Mm. Well, revere and reverence, reverence and awe. awe. You can be awed by God's beauty and goodness and glory. So fear but is an unfortunate translation. It is an translation. translation. Now, I think that, that, that this, is, this paragraph that you read puts its finger on what I, I would reckon, and I think Paul would agree with me, is, is the number one uh, human and pastoral issue that we have is that, does God really love me? Mm -hmm. Well, if God is not, from, my, from what I'm talking about, if God is not eternally, Father, Son, and Spirit. If there is a, a G-O-D, a single person behind that that then one day decided we're going to have community, then that God behind the Father, Son, and Spirit is the real God. And a single person God is not other-centered, not approachable. It's not interested in fellowship. It does not love out of its nature. It doesn't need. And it, does, it, it does not create out of other-centeredness. Yeah. So this is, to me, is that this is why the Trinity, one of the reasons it's so critical is because the Father, Son, and Spirit, as Athanasius said, the Holy Trinity is no created thing. God has always been Father, Son, and Spirit. Yeah. And the only way they know to be is as Father, Son, and Spirit. And that's who they are. That's who, that's who God is in that communion of love. And that's the way they relate to everything in their creation. So the reason God loves us is not because he just, his blood sugar happened to be up one day and decided to create the universe. The reason he loves us is because that's what the Father, Son, and Spirit do. I can count on that. Mm. Now, that doesn't mean I, I, can, I, well, it, I, mean, I can go do anything I want. There are consequences for that. Mm -hmm. But one thing I know is that no matter what happens in life, I am loved forever. And that, and that love forever means that, he, the, that the Father, Son, and Spirit are loving me constantly to set me free to live in that love. Mm -hmm. And, and that's something you can hold on to because what I hear being preached all the time is, a, is this, this model where you've got God is essentially your judge and can become your father if you repent and believe. Mm. And it's the windshield wiper thing to me. It's like, well, okay, let's be honest about that. I remember the first time that I was consciously aware of repenting and believe, believing. And then two years later, I had another experience. And then three years later, I had another experience. So what, how much did I really repent and believe? And who, who in the equation of the Christian church can really raise their hand and look and say, I have now graduated from Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And that just means that, that God's being is sitting there flipping back and forth between being our judge and our father. So what the early church understood was that fatherhood is first and eternal. 
And out of that relationship, we were created and we're loved. That's what we believe. That's what we count on. That's what we struggle to understand. And that's nature. So God's love for me is not dependent upon me getting something right. Mm -hmm. I can't change it. I'm not so powerful as to tamper with, with his, with the being of the Father, Son, and Spirit. They love. That's good news. Now let's walk together in that. That's great news. And, and the other, another piece of this too is that to the degree that fear exists in my life, because if perfect love casts out fear and the one who fears is not perfected in love, and that's, a, that's not a value statement, it's just an observation. If that's true, then the degree that there's fear in my life, to that degree, I don't understand the love of God for me. Because you, know, you either have one or the other. And, um, and, and that helps me because then I can recognize uh, I've got something wrong in my paradigm about the character and nature of God. We live in an uncertain world. Uh, as everybody knows, there's a lot of things that we just can't count on. And uh, where are we going to plant our feet? It's got to be in the certainty of the character of God. But if we're caught in betwixt two temperaments, right, where love is a temperament and, and justice is a temperament or judging is a temperament, and it's based on my performance, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm too broken. And my history is too shattered to compete in the environment of performance. It's not going to happen. And even if you weren't broke, even if you were sure. good, you still couldn't trust it because you've got this whole dimension of judgment that's not integrated with Father. Of course the Father's going to judge us. Because He loves us, He will judge us to the roots of our soul and separate all darkness from us so we get to live in, in the place where there's only light. Of course He will judge. He's not going to let any of us off the hook with anything because He loves us. Right. Because it's His character to love us. That's just the most liberating and freeing thing to me. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that. That's the, the very center of the book is, is aren't that we, issue. Aren't we afraid not to be afraid? I mean, I mean you, you don't want to be afraid. I mean, you, 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 can, you can hear, uh, you, you can read uh, The Shack. You can read a book like this that gets into the theology that is behind and under and through The Shack about who God is for us. You know, and yet, that's you know, a great point. And you're, you're, but you're afraid to not be afraid. We think intimacy is devalued if we're not afraid, which is crazy. In our in our relationships, in a healthy relationship between a mother and a daughter, or a mother and a son, or a father and a daughter, intimacy creates a greater degree of respect. And we have a paradigm that says intimacy is an eradication of respect. Something's wrong. Familiarity breeds contempt. Right. So there's something wrong. My, my point, I think back to a degree too, is that intimacy creates a higher degree of respect because you, you get to know the person deeper and deeper, and you have an expanded view of what that is, and then love just surrounds that. You hear, well, you're not taking sin seriously, <laughs> uh, or you're just but kidding yourself. You're actually, what you're actually thing. taking seriously is the beauty of the love of the Father, Son, and Spirit. The question is, is there anything in this universe better, more beautiful, more life-giving, more blessed than the love of the Father, Son, and Spirit? And is there anything? Now, from where we're sitting, there seems like a lot of options, but from where the Father, Son, and Spirit are sitting, that's the best thing ever. So how long is it going to take us to work through all the things that we think we've got to do before we come to see, that's what I want. I want to be in the middle of that. And so what we're doing is we're trying to, the Christian community is trying to find a way to keep these people in these, on these paths by using fear. And they're not able to move. They're just, they're just living in fear. They're not getting to know that they're loved. And, and the Father, Son, and Spirit are, are prepared and indeed have run a huge risk in creating human beings and giving us freedom. But they know something. They know that we're not going to find anything in the cosmos anywhere that is anywhere close to the love and the life that they share together that we're included in. How long is it going to take us? And, and is, is the point here that the Christian church is to have everybody so afraid we just do right all the time? I mean, that's like having a, having a, a child that's, that you're growing up and you want them to free, be free, but at 10 years old, they get frozen into doing right. and so They never get to grow up, and they never get to experience love in the house. Is that what the Father, Son, and Spirit, is that what this creation is about? They want us to come to the place to where we look at them and say, I'm in. My whole heart, I want to be a part of this. This is the best thing. That's what Jesus said to Peter. I mean, Peter said to Jesus, 
well, Lord, where are we going to go? I mean, what, you got the yeah. best thing there is. What is, it, what is it about us that is so twisted up that we need an angry, vengeful, vindictive God? What is it about us? Well, yeah. we, want, we want people we don't like to... Uh, <laughs> to suffer the consequences. <laughs> well, yeah. Right? Yeah. Somebody's yeah. got to pay. You know, you know in, the, in the book, in the shack, Papa doesn't let Mackenzie off on anything. But Papa doesn't walk around with a big stick with a nail on it to prove a point, right? It's love that pushes Mackenzie into dealing with these things. And what is it? The kindness of God leads us to repentance, right? And, and we think it's the anger or the fury or whatever. It's not that God is not angry or furious against everything that is damaging his creation, including the things that are damaging me, his child. You know, that's true. And, and we're for that. In fact, the, the more we see of the goodness of God, the more we're, we're for him burning out of my life everything that keeps me from being free and, and causes me to, to damage relationships and, and my family and on and on and on. So that, that just goes. We just want, we want to be judged in that sense. Absolutely, because we trust his goodness in that judgment, not some behind the scenes of vindictiveness. And, and we tend to have behind the love of God, there is really another agenda, or the Father has a different agenda. And then we say silly things like the intimacy that exists between Papa and Mackenzie, as if that's an affront to the character of God. That's what they got mad at Jesus for, his intimacy with the Father. And what we don't understand is we got included into that Im intimacy. That's the whole point that everything is by, for, and through, and in Jesus. And that we exist in that relationship with the Father because we're carried in Him. We're created in Him. But, and then he's turning around and talking about God as Abba when the entire Old Testament never even conceived of the idea of intimacy. And yet here's Jesus talking in the most familial, deepest kinds of senses that we understand as human beings in relationship to our kids. But then we couldn't understand that in relationship to God. And yet here Jesus absolutely models for us right smack in front of us. And it is such an affront that he ends up getting killed for it. There's a, um, uh, if, you go, if you can go on YouTube and you look for uh, God loves everyone. There are a number of voices that uh, get absolutely uh, furious about the, the idea of anyone saying such a thing. How, you, how what a damnable lie that is! And that, they, they, that God they, loves that everyone. God loves everyone, and they they go to the passage that says uh, how uh, Esau I hated, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. There. If God hates Esau, then he hates someone, then, then he doesn't love everyone. And so therefore, you better straighten up and live right, because God does not love everybody. It's a damnable lie that he loves everybody. Are they afraid that someone's going to show up on the gates of heaven uh, and be accepted in that's not supposed to be there? Well, it's certainly not Esau. Well, and see, people who bring up that story, obviously, they don't understand their scripture very well. Because you go back to the Old Testament story, and there was a blessing on both those boys from the beginning. And yes, Esau and Jacob, there was a distinction in terms of the redemptive plan. And that's what that term is. Not a, it's not a psychological hate that's here. It's a separation saying the plan includes this boy, not this boy. But you read the story, there's total reconciliation between Jacob and Esau, inside the love of the Father in that story. So there's a lot more going on with that story than we just look at at first glance. And, and, and that's part of the question. Mackenzie faces it in the judge, judgment scene, and where he is sitting in the seat of judgment, where he is to judge God and the entire human race. And he realizes that's exactly what he's done. And he's built the character and nature of God that is not love, and therefore not trustworthy, and not good, and then everything else flows from that. If we believe in a God who is that ogre, distant, omnibeing, then we will read the Jacob Esau section of Romans or wherever, mm. and we will read it through that lens. You've got those glasses, right? It's, yeah, they're somewhere around here. Yeah. So, so it's just a paradigm 
and you're going to hear the kind of God that you believe in. The, the, the sad thing is that people... And you're going to pull that right out of its context in order to prove your point. Yeah, and people become... There you go. So people you, become like the God. You look very different to me right now, Mike. So do you. Yeah. <laughs> very well, different. Now, now... Now, now you look like Baxter. <laughs> <laughs> but we see through the lens of our own paradigms. And we become like the God that we worship. And I, I think... Yeah. I do believe... and this. Uh, Athanasius says that the God of all is good and supremely noble by nature. Therefore, he is the lover of the human race. Now, I mean, that's what the early church came to see. And I don't think that we can overestimate the goodness of God and overestimate the love of God. Some people hear me saying that and says, well, I'm just saying everybody can do whatever they want to do. I'm saying that he is so good and he loves us so much. He is going to bring us to the place to where we want to participate in this life with all our hearts. That we will, we don't, we're not going to need bob wire in heaven because we will hate everything that's dark and is hurtful to us and to others. And we, we only want to be in, in sharing in that life. That's a very different thing than we're going to go to heaven because we don't want to go to hell. And we're actually hoping that we can be in heaven but not ever, not ever have to run into uh, the God that we fear. Uh, and, and, uh, and also the people that we don't like. Well, and, and <laughs> I think a lot of times when people bring up the, the issue of you're being soft on sin, is a lot of times they have an attraction to, to sin that they're trying to avoid. Yeah. That we don't want that attraction in our lives at all. And we're not being soft on sin at all. We're not saying, well, just go do anything because it doesn't matter. Every, it all matters. Yeah. And we're saying, look, it matters because these things are devastating our lives. And here, here's the dynamic. We are included in this circle of other-centered life and love. That's who we are. That's our nature. When We're free to do whatever we want, but when we violate that way of being, it hurts like hell. Mm -hmm. it's, there's, no, there's no escape from it. You're free to go live in any darkness you want, but it hurts like hell because this is who we are. And there's an education process that's sure. happening so we can come to see It's it. a journey, isn't it? It is You're a journey. It's a process. on a journey toward Christ. And, an incremental and, process. And that, that journey can have some, some pretty uh, bad places in it if you want to make some bad choices. There are consequences. And sometimes it's not choices you made for yourself. Exactly. Oftentimes. Oftentimes. Well, McKenzie and oftentimes changed you to the cause tree. things on other people that they didn't make for themselves. And that's that part, of the, part of why we're so opposed to the darkness and we're opposed to the sin yeah. because we've seen what it's done to people that we cared for and yeah. we loved. And yeah. the darkness that I hold on to, I don't just keep to myself. Yeah. That's a great point. We share it, whether wittingly or unwittingly. We share it with others. Uh, one other portion of the book I wanted to get to before we... Uh, are finished is uh, the, right one, the wonderful exchange. It's a it's it's a uh, quote from uh, Apostle Paul at the at the at the beginning. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake so <laughs> it'd be easier if I put the glasses on. There we go. Uh, that though though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. That you through his poverty might become rich and you go on to expound on this concept of the wonderful exchange that uh, in that McKinsey is it, it learns about in yes that. in that chapter in in particular what i'm trying to show is that, that the, one of the themes in the shack is that what mckinsey is getting in this in this relationship is not simply forgiveness He's getting to share in all that the Father, Son, and Spirit have together. Now, that's, uh, that's the ancient gospel. And so I quoted uh, Irenaeus. For you know, you, uh, I, mean, I quoted Paul first, and Irenaeus said, our, our Lord, who became what we are, to bring us to be what He is. And we're so locked in the West to the whole guilt and sin thing that we don't see much more than forgiveness going on in Jesus and the cross. Irenaeus, the ancient father, said our Lord Jesus became what we are in order to bring us to be what he is in his relation with the Father and the Son. Calvin, the same way, I quote Calvin on that. He's beautiful. And then J.B. Torrance says that he, his, he said the, the incarnation, the prime purpose of the coming of Jesus in the love of God is to bring us to be included in this communion. 
that we may participate in the Trinitarian life of God. So what is given to us in the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus is not simply forgiveness. Jesus reaches in and takes our darkness and our, and, our, and, and our hell and takes it into himself so that then he can pitch his tent, as it were, uh, in the midst of our darkness and pain. So everything that he is in his experience of the Father and the Holy Spirit and as Lord of creation then becomes ours. That's the point is that we're going to be brought to participate in Jesus' relation with his Father and in his anointing in the Holy Spirit and in his relationship with everything in the entire cosmos. Because he remains the creator. But that's because of who he is, and he's bringing us to be there. So. And he remains one of us. Yeah, right. and, and part of this exchange is that not only have we been included into this life, whether we know it or not, or even want it or not at this point, yeah. we've been included. That was the, the plan and purpose of adoption from before the foundation of the world. So not only has that happened, but in exchange also, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, John 14, 15, 16, 17, right? Come and climb inside of our shacks, the places of our darkness, and meet us, regardless of whether we've yet mm -hmm. repented or not. I mean, there is, a, there is a process in which God is working in the heart of every human being to restore them to the desire that he has for them, which is everything that they were intended to be. And, and, and this is where the, there's, a, there's a whole atonement theory or theology bound up in the shack, too. And, and the, and the main point to me, and this is what part of what I'm talking about with the wonderful exchange, is the way that Papa and Jesus and Sada you get inside of Mackenzie's shack, which is his soul, which in particular is, is the brokenness. They're there before he even knows them, them or who they are. They've accepted. And the, the Father, Son, and Spirit have pitched their tent inside human darkness and sin and treachery and betrayal. And they got there by Jesus submitting himself to suffer from us. Yep. Jesus says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you make me the scapegoat, and you're going to pour your wrath out on me. It's not the Father's wrath being poured out on Jesus. It's our wrath. It's our rage. It's our curse. We damned him. We beat him. We crucified him, and we mocked him. And he said, I'm going to take this, because as you do this to me and as I accept this, I am entering into a relationship with you in the very pit of your darkness and confusion and brokenness. And I'm bringing my Father and I'm bringing the Holy Spirit with me. And we're not going away because you can't kill me again. You this know? idea of this distant God, it's not a new thing. Isaiah writes about the atonement, and this is what Isaiah says. We, human beings, esteemed him, Jesus, stricken by God. That's how we, that's how we looked at it. We, th we think of God in such light that we esteemed him stricken by God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Focus on what he endured in order to meet us. So he who is rich becomes poor by our own hand that, we, that he may meet us in our poverty with his wealth. And it's, it's, a, it's the redeeming genius of the Father, Son, and Spirit is they're going to establish the new covenant with Israel and with the human race. And here's how they're going to establish it. They're going to establish it by taking our worst treachery, by allowing us to betray them and murder them. And they're going to pitch the tent of the new covenant relationship in the teeth of our betrayal. Hmm. If that's not genius... And not be so. And now that's the secret. That's the mystery. That's been done. That's real. We're all included. Where are we in the journey of understanding? I think we've got a long way to go yet. To put it in McKinsey's words, uh, in the shack, uh, he says, "We want you." Or Jesus says to him, "We want you to join us in our circle of fellowship. I don't want slaves to my will. I want brothers and sisters who will share life with me." Yeah. They didn't want Christian robots who are doing everything right but have no heart. And he, Jesus, wants Mackenzie on the dock. Mackenzie's crying to him, saying, Jesus, I feel lost. That's real. That's what he really feels. I feel lost. And he holds his hand. Jesus holds his hand and says, I know how you feel, Mackenzie, but I'm with you, and I'm not lost. I'm sorry you feel that way, but hear me. You're not lost because I have a hold of you. Now, when you hear that, when McKenzie begins to hear that in his pain, he's beginning to discover who has met him in his hell. That's a relationship of acceptance and love that can rekindle a man's dignity in life. 
and give him some hope that he's a part of something way bigger than, than just him or just his religious obedience. Mm. It's a beautiful thing. Thanks for coming. Man, what a great day. Been a great conversation. Thanks for inviting us. Ben, I'm again honored. Thank you. This has been You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.